So there's our title, Help on the Way, the Archetype of the Assisting Force. And of course, we need to find out what is meant by the assisting force. And so we're going to take turns reading. Marilyn, would you read this first slide? Sure. So just read slowly and loud enough for everybody to hear. Yes, let me know if I'm not reading loud enough. Okay. She is there or here for me. He comes through for me. They are in my corner. He is on my team. She supports me. He has my back. They prop me up. They encourage the best in me. She backs me up. He stands up for me. She believes in me. They are at my side. He has my best interests at heart. She shows me who I am. They look out for me. He helps me be myself. Thank you. So if you've ever said any of these about someone, that's the assisting force in your life. The person who um, is an ally to your growth, who wants the best for you and encourages the best in you. And uh, this is um, a wonderful characteristic of friendship And of course, it also needs to be part of relationship. Sometimes in an intimate relationship, we don't feel that this is really happening. And that's when we need to do some work on what's going on with us. But um, if there's someone who comes through for you and has always come through, or even come through once, that's your assisting force. This word, this phrase assisting force is uh, describing a character in the story of the heroic journey. Because the hero or heroine always has uh, an assisting force, a sidekick, uh, someone who uh, runs interference, who helps with the project of moving along on the path. Okay, Uh, Judith McDermott. Okay, these are references to the necessary and needed character on our human journey. The The ally, the reliable companion, the assisting force. The term assisting force refers to a specific character in stories the world over and all through the centuries. In every heroic journey story, the hero or heroine requires a companion to rely on for assistance. This is someone or more than one who step in to help who lend a hand or a shoulder. The assisting force joins in with us, guides, guards, informs, prompts, collaborates with us on our own heroic journey. This ally is commonly depicted in stories as a sidekick, an aide, a wise advisor, a scout, a pathfinder, a trailblazer, a spirit guide, an accompanying force. Thank you. So that pulls together what I just mentioned. Helen? Yes, yes. 
Without the conscious acknowledgement of our fellowship with those around us, there can be no synthesis of personality. Individuation, psychological and spiritual maturation, does not shut out the world, but gathers it to oneself. You cannot individuate on Everest. Carl Jung. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't complete your human journey or have a truly rich life if you're like the Unibomber, if you're um, keeping away from everyone and um, not acknowledging the importance of other people around you. So when he says you can't individuate, and individuate is the Jungian term for how we become mature psychologically and spiritually. Uh, you can't do that sitting alone on the top of Mount Everest. And of course, this fits with the very um, name of our genus. We are mammals. And, and as you may know, that word mammal comes from M-A-M-M-A, -M -M -A, which means breast hence mammogram. We're in, we, all of us mammals need someone right from the beginning. So it's even built into our very nature that we can't survive alone. Right from the first moment when we were when we were ready to come out into the world, we needed the midwife or the doctor. And then we needed the mother with the uh, nourishment. And then all through the life span, we require others. And what Jung is saying is that we want to acknowledge this consciously, this fellowship with other humans, even show gratitude to one another. I want you to know I'm glad that you're in my life. That's what you sound like when you're acknowledging the fact of human togetherness. Isn't this a beautiful topic to be talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. Rachel. Also, Rachel, I, I guess you didn't get a chance to introduce yourself. Do you want to just start? Yeah. I'm Rachel. I am in my uh, little urban garden near Lake Merritt in Oak Oakland. Um, ally means connection as well as we see it in its Latin root, allegory, bind to. The word companion literally means one who shares bread with us. Indeed, our circle of allies is present with us at a spiritual banquet. We are celebrating the feast of full humanness, always combining ourselves and our assisting forces. Connection is a need in the human psyche. Indeed, the deep psyche knows that an ally is crucial to our growth. This may explain why a lonely child makes up an imaginary friend. Our longing for an ally is born. Perhaps our loneliness is the psyche's sly way of getting us to seek an ally. Thank you. Uh, the word pan, uh, P A N, is from the Latin word panis, which means bread. And so, companion is uh, the one who shares bread with me. Um, in other words, shares the uh, nourishment that the world offers. We're not just talk, talking about uh, good luck that we found someone to be with us. We're talking about a need that's just as strong as the need for food, warmth, and safety. And our deep psyche 
always knew that we needed others and never forgets it. And I'll check in with you for questions in a couple of minutes. <clears throat> Uh, Catherine Weisenberg. The assisting force is part of the archetype of grace, the gift dimension of life. Graces are benefits that come to us without our having to merit or earn them. They help us traverse our path by endowing us with wisdom and powers we thought were beyond us. Allies anchor us and set sail with us on the human voyage beyond what we imagined possible. This is how allies are graces. Everything we can say about grace, we can say about allies. Thank you. Grace refers to the gift dimension of life. So in the course of life, we're always combining effort and grace. I'll give a simple example. Um, <clears throat> when you go out and water the garden, you're putting effort into the flowering of everything in the garden. But when it rains, that's a gift from above. And that's the equivalent of grace. You don't have to be religious to believe there's such a thing as grace. Everyone has noticed that in the course of life, <clears throat> some things have happened that we know we didn't make happen. Or sometimes we knew something, suddenly realized something, had an intuition, uh, and we know we didn't think it up. So that's what grace refers to. So I'm going to say a word about archetypes, and then we'll open it up for questions, because, because here I'm saying there's an archetype of grace. So by archetype, we mean like an innate energy. It's a natural inclination in every human, something like the instinct in an animal. And it's a... Um, component of what Jung called the collective unconscious. That means <clears throat> the deep knowing in all of us humans. And um, examples of the archetypes are mother, father, king, queen, hero, god, angel, saint, teacher, shadow, or villain, demon, trickster, and of course, assisting forces or afflicting forces, which we'll talk about in a minute. So over the centuries, people noticed that these particular uh, characters that we run into in the course of life uh, are important. Your mother's important, your father's important, and so forth. And they started putting these characters into stories. And so uh, they became motifs of stories the world over. The central story is an heroic journey. Someone leaves home goes through a series of struggles in search of a gift. And when he or she finds the gift, brings it back to the uh, home that he or she left. So films or stories that you definitely keep remembering, such as Wizard of Oz, Star Wars, The Matrix, Casablanca, the reason they survive in your memory and imagination is because 
they are full of archetypes. For instance, Dorothy has three physical assisting forces, the scarecrow, the tin man, and the cowardly lion. And then she has one spiritual resource, that's the good witch. She also has afflicting forces, the evil witch and her army. And likewise in Star Wars and so forth. <clears throat> now, religion showed that, or, or declared that these archetypes, mother, father, king, queen, that they're not only actual people, for instance, your biological mother, but that all of them exist in some transcendent non-material realm in addition to being here on earth. And of course, you believe this or not in accord with your own belief system. So there's, there's your biological father, and then there's our father who art in heaven. There's King Charles III, and there's also uh, God is the king of the whole universe. There's the villain, and then there's the devil. So religion took the archetypes and personified them and uh, also took an archetype like the death resurrection theme and turned it into a ritual. So that would be baptism or the theme of growing up and being ready to step into the world as an adult. So that would be a bar, a bar bar mitzvah or, or confirmation. So in effect, both literature and religion preserves the archetypes. Literature presents them in entertaining ways and religion presents them in beliefs, rituals, and mystical experiences. And the final place where the archetypes exist are in, the, in our dreams, <clears throat> which Freud called the royal road to the unconscious, because sometimes you will dream of one of these characters. So all the archetypes are in us, but our calling in life may be to one or more of them. For instance, we might be called to be mother, father, wounded healer, etc. And we're all called to be assisting forces to one another. And let's see, Libby, would you read this? An ally is a backer. The purpose, the opposite of backing us up is putting us down, thwarting our intents, hindering our progress, sabotaging our growth. We have all met people like that. They are not assisting forces, but afflicting forces. In any heroic journey story, the hero or heroine meets up with both assisting and afflicting characters. For example, in the film, The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy's three friends and Glinda the Good Witch are assisting forces, while the evil witch and her army are afflicting forces. As we know, ultimately, both forces helped Dorothy find her own power, the true purpose of her journey. Edmund Burke expressed it well. He that wrestles with us strengthens our nerves and sharpens our skill. Our antagonist is our helper. Wow. Thank you. So another example of how it's not really a dualism. Ultimately, even the ones who are afflicting us can help us, as Burke says, uh, 
as you wrestle with someone, you build up your skills at wrestling. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, in the story of, of The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy uh, found the, the courage to overcome the witch. Notice the, uh, here, this is a picture of the witch um, trying to grab Dorothy. She has a fiendish smile on her face. Dorothy has an expression of fear. So that would be a, the archetype of the afflicting force. Sometimes the afflicting force is purposely trying to help us. So in, in the, the witch is not trying to help Dorothy, but Dorothy finds help from her own courage and from the collaboration with her friends who help her free herself from the witch's castle. But this character, the, the Buddhist Bodhisattva Manjushri, holding the, the sword, he afflicts us, but he's trying to help us directly. This is the sword that cuts through dualism, that cuts through the ego, which loves to divide and conquer. And so one of the, um, shall we say, saints of Buddhism is this Manjushri who um, helps us through something that might be painful. So somebody really gives you a wake up call and shows you you're not all you're cracked up to be that ultimately helps you, but it'll feel afflicting as you go through it. So I wanted to be sure that we saw that sometimes the afflicting force is really on our side. Now we can understand why there are bodhisattvas and saints. What's a bodhisattva? It's a, um, in the Buddhist tradition, it's someone who has attained enlightenment, but he or she does not want to enter the reward of nirvana because he or she wants to stay on earth and help the rest of us find enlightenment. That's called bodhisattva. And it's the, pretty much the same as saints and angels uh, in other traditions. So remember that our, our, our theme is the allies, both visible and invisible. This is one of the invisible ones. Uh, Shirley? Ultimately, the archetype of the assisting force the visible or invisible ally who shows up just in time, gives us an assurance that we are not alone. This book by Emily Dickinson expresses it beautifully. Alone I cannot be, for hosts do visit me. Their coming may be known by couriers within. Their going is not, for they've never gone. What a perfect way to describe the invisible uh, assisting force. I'm continually being visited by hosts of angels, shall we say, using that archetype. And the way I know that they have come is I feel their message within me. 
And I know that they're not gone because they stay with me. Okay, uh, Lava. Here are some examples of assisting forces. Uh, Nancy Orfield. Our main assisting force is our deepest identity beyond our limited personality, what Jung calls the higher self. This was a there was a new voice which you slowly recognized as your own that kept you company by Mary Oliver and the journey. <clears throat> Yes, awareness of the self gives us a sense of a reliable interior divine accompaniment right here inside us, or rather we are right here inside it, not to all one experience. Our inner self is... Our inner self is... The thou in the for thou art with me. Yeah, as in the 23rd Psalm. Um, so I want to pay, pay attention to this, uh, these wonderful lines by Mary Oliver. She felt that she heard a new voice inside of her. Remember Emily Dickinson saying, there are, cur there are couriers within me, uh, something, uh, divine messengers. There was a new voice, and I slowly recognized that the new voice that I heard inside myself, which was giving me wisdom and intuitions, was my own voice. And not only was it my own voice, but it even kept me company. She has summarized my entire topic. The central ally is your own inner self. That's what's keeping you company. Company, C-O-M is with and the P-A-N is bread. That's what's sharing bread with you. That's what's nourishing you, a power inside yourself that Jung calls the self with a capital S, or sometimes called the higher self. It's a reliable interior accompaniment, just as she says, keeps me company accompaniment, right here inside us, or rather we are right here inside of it, not two, but all one experience. So once again, it can't be dualistic. It's all one. And we, even, we can even go so far as to say, and I'll talk about this again later, that in the 23rd Psalm, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. That thou, of course, is the God of David. David wrote the Psalm, King David. And he's referring to God as the shepherd. Lord is my shepherd. But we can go one step further in this um, Jungian realization and also mystical realization that everything becomes one. So there's no longer a separate thou. The thou is interior as well as around us. Now that the world is, now that we know that the world is round, God is not up there. God is all around. But look what Mary Oliver says. I recognize that as my own self. So here are some examples of these exterior archetypes, family, Friends, 
intimate relationship. Here's the first intimate relationship. The second intimate relationship. The third int uh, intimate relationship. Teachers who have helped you find out something that you didn't know before, who have shown you uh, skills that you didn't know you had, um, even pointed you to what really interests you like art or sports or science or math or poetry. The, the people in the past who gave so much of themselves so that we could have the rights that we now enjoy. There are assisting forces also, even though they're no longer with us, uh, they helped us even before we arrived. Okay, Dawn, D-A-W-N. Assisting forces do not have to be human. Thank you, Don. Obviously, the first and most wonderful non-human assisting force is nature itself. Every tree, every mountain, every pond, every sky, every cloud, they're all assisting us on our life journey. Likewise, pets, animals are certainly assisting forces all throughout our lifespan. Art is an assisting force, showing us the richness in our creativity. Icons assist us because an icon, which is a religious picture, shows us powers that are in ourselves. For instance, in this archetype, we have St. George slaying the dragon, the, uh, the shadow side, <clears throat> and um, showing us that we have that same power in ourselves. In Buddhism, we have mandalas. They assist us recognize, in recognizing our wholeness. And of course, the wonderful assisting forces all through life are books that took us into a world beyond ourselves and taught us so much and uh, enlivened our imagination. Now this is a very important assisting force. So this is a thimble Think of this as the thimble that you saw on your grandmother's or mother's finger when you came home from school and she was doing the darning. And she looked so peaceful. And when she died, you found this thimble and it became a keepsake. A keepsake is an object that to the rest of the world looks ordinary, but to you has taken on special meaning. It has transcendent meaning. In other words, it transcends what it really is. It's really just a thimble, but to you, it's more precious even than anything else because it's a connection to such an important assisting force in your life, namely 
the mothering or grandmothering or the aunts or or your older sister or whoever um, used to be with you and is no longer with you. In fact, in my mind, a keepsake is a is the proof that there is such a thing as the transcendent because it shows you that something could have a bigger meaning than what meets the eye. Okay, um, Francis McCormick. Here are some examples of sidekicks, another example of assisting forces. Thank you. I didn't even notice in my childhood going to all those Western movies. I always noticed, I always saw that there was a sidekick. Here's Gabby Hayes with Roy Rogers. But it never occurred to me that uh, it's a necessary part of the story. He's not just there for comic relief. The hero can't do everything he needs to do without the sidekick. We can't do everything we need to do as humans without the help of all those who are assisting us. Even the Lone Ranger has someone to help him. Don Quixote has Sancho Panza. This is not just coincidence. The people who wrote the stories or made up or wrote the scripts of the movies, they were remaining loyal to the archetypes that they were brought up with and that they knew were real. Star Wars, look at all the assisting forces. Sometimes the character is a special teacher who, as in Obi-Wan Kenobi, who helps the hero find his own destiny. He not only teaches the hero how to use the special sword, he not only helps him as he does battle with the evil forces, he shows him that he is important to the entire galaxy. This is a very special assisting force. He's not a sidekick. He's the one who helped you really know yourself and your life purpose. And occasionally the sidekick is um, something that doesn't necessarily have to be human. As in um, the Star Wars episodes where in which the hero is helped by uh, computers. Elaine, would you read this one? Spiritual allies are ultimately interior. They are our own energies and potentials with the look of, that is personified as bodhisattvas, angels, saints, spiritual beings helping us toward enlightenment. They reflect the full spectrum of spiritual powers in all of us. Buddhist teacher Dan Lighton, in Faces of Compassion, stated it clearly. The bodhisattvas are not glorified, exotic, unnatural beings, but simply our own best qualities in full flower. We see the same concept from Meister Eckhart in a 
breakthrough, I find that God and I are both the same. Sheer, pure, limpid unity, free of all duality. Here are some examples of spiritual assisting forces. Okay, before I go on to those, um, just to remind ourselves, um, what we're basically saying is these spiritual forces, these invisible allies, inhabit our inner life. So when you go deep into yourself and make contact with yourself, the part of you that's not on your driver's license, the part that is a mirror reflection of God and saints, now you're seeing in a breakthrough with Master Eckhart that God and I are both the same. When you when, when that happens, that's a moment of prayer. That's what prayer is. It's making contact with the God within. And we're still talking to God as if he were out up on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. It's, it's not, it's, it doesn't have that deep entry into our true self. Okay, so our, here's one example. This would be the Buddha. And again, it's not the Buddha who lived 500 years before Christ. It's the enlightened being of all of us. This is Tara, the male Buddha who hears the cries of those who are suffering and continually pours out graces to them. This is Jizo, J-I-Z-O. This is the Japanese um, title of the equivalent in Buddhism of the guardian angel. He's the patron of children and he's also the patron of travelers, and he's the one who uh, leads you to the afterlife when you die. And, and the, he, the equivalent of this person is the guardian angel in the Judeo-Christian religion. Uh, both uh, Jews and Christians believe in angels, um, assisting, invisible assisting forces who are guiding and guarding us even without our realizing it. So the two children are on the rickety bridge, but the guardian angel is making sure that they remain safe. Why did someone come up with this mystical realization. It must be that deep inside all of us is a, a, a belief that there's something more helping us than just ourselves. And of course, you don't have to believe this, but it certainly enriches your experience as a human when you do. The Virgin Mary is, of course, the central assisting archetypal divine feminine in the Christian world. Um, religions that are extremely patriarchal uh, don't put an accent on the divine feminine or even accept that there is such a thing. But uh, um, Hinduism, Christianity, Buddhism, they all have the female divine archetype. This picture is so touching because look at the left hand of Jesus. It's all the way around Mary's neck. 
and the way he's holding her, he's holding on to her, that even um, one who is divine needs the divine feminine. This is Krishna in the Hindu tradition and his wife Radha. And Krishna is the one who um, helps us along our path through life. This is Hermes in the ancient Greek religion. He was thought of as the one who shepherded the people. So he's holding a, a ram and uh, they had a ceremony in which he walked around the city walls. Of, I'm sorry, a young man walked around the city walls carrying a ram, symbolizing the and asking for the graces of Hermes to protect the town. Or another way of saying it is, they believed that there was divine assistance and that they could, through a ritual, invite this assistance to be present. And of course, this image of the man carrying the ram is the same as the Judeo-Christian image of the Lord is my shepherd. This is an early Christian statue of Jesus as the Good Shepherd. And in the 23rd Psalm, uh, we have this. Uh, Catherine de Lorm, would you read this? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. It couldn't be a more direct example of the divine archetype of the assisting force than this. And of course, that word yea, Y-E-A, is the old word for yes. So let's go through it. Yes, even though I find myself in a dark valley, one that's death dealing, I won't be afraid because I have a companion. This companion is the God of David who wrote, King David who wrote the Psalm. So he's saying, uh, I have God with me and so I no longer fear. Okay, uh, Steve, would you read this one? Or did you already read, Steve? No, I haven't. Okay, um, go ahead. Those who have died, the ancestors, can be thought of as assisting forces to us who are still here on Earth. Some are unknown. Some are immediate family members now gone. We may, we might believe that. It's a good thing to talk to them in our hearts and minds. We can ask them for help in hard times. They can, they still care about us and help us from beyond the grave. We can heal some of the trauma that they never had a chance to complete in their own lifetime. That is truly lay them to rest. At times, even when we don't ask, we might feel their presence, their energy supporting us. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, uh, Diana, person? Yes, in Christianity, this sense of connection with and help from those who have died reflects the doctrine of the communion of saints. Those whom we love 
and lose are no longer where they were before. They are wherever we are now. St. John Christestone. I will spend my heaven doing good on earth. St. Teresa. She's the patron of the missions. So this doctrine of communion of saints has to do with how the dead are still helping us and how we can turn to them and ask for help. And uh, this is a picture by Raphael uh, painted in 1509. It's in the Vatican Museum. And I'll kind of explain it. Um, so the top part are the ones who have died. And they're um, in the clouds with God. So here is God, the, the Hebrew God, Yahweh. He's holding the globe, the earth in his hand. So God caring about earth and also created earth. This is his son, Jesus. On our left is his mother, Mary. On our right is St. John the Baptist, his cousin. Under Jesus is the Holy Spirit. This is the spirit mentioned in the first sentence of the book of Genesis. The earth, in the beginning, the earth was void and the spirit of God glided over the waters and God said, let there be light. Uh, the Holy Spirit is in the center of four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels that tell about the life of Christ. And uh, the, the, the person wearing orange and blue on the far left in the above, in the top section is St. Peter. And the one on the right is St. Paul. Both of them were Jewish and followers of Christ. Then on the bottom part, you have the people uh, nowadays. Um, so here's Raphael himself. He's wearing... Uh, kind of a yellow orange shirt and a blue cloak. And um, they're discussing the communion, uh, the meaning of communion. In fact, the name of the picture is the discussion about communion. So this, is, this picture gives you the sense of what the communion of saints is about. Or another way of saying it is, religion takes the deepest beliefs that humans have cherished over the centuries and turns them into a belief in religion or a ritual. And the ritual happens right here. This is the altar holding the um, golden, what's called monstrance, which means that which displays something, it's displaying the communion host right there in the center. Okay, Ann Withers. Here is an example of how a lowly creature can be the assisting force for a powerful one. Yeah, so it seems like our assisting forces would be people equal to us or above us, but sometimes it gets reversed. And an example of the reversal is the Aesop's fable of the lion and the mouse. The lion was about to eat the mouse, when the mouse said, don't eat me, someday I will help you if you let me go. The lion laughed. He said, I'm the king of the jungle. I would never need you. The mouse said, let's just wait and see. A few days later, the lion was caught in a trap set by humans, and he was going to be taken to a zoo 
But the mouse came along and said, I'm going to keep my promise. And he gnawed on the ropes to set the lion free. Why does someone write a story like this? It's because he noticed that sometimes the assisting force works in reverse to what we expect. So you can be helped by anyone, not just by people who seem to know more than you or seem to be stronger than you. And of course, you can be the assisting force to those who are stronger or bigger than you. This is uh, from the book of Isaiah, a Jewish prophet who said, uh, someday the lion will lie down with the lamb and uh, the baby goat will lie down with the baby uh, tiger. Um, and a little child shall lead them. Yarko, have you read? There will also be times in our lives when we feel alone and unaccompanied, lost and lonesome. We cannot even access our own inner resources. Our usual ways of comforting ourselves no longer work. It is an episode in every her heroic journey story. The helper needs help. This is perhaps a, a way of showing us our limitations, making us humble, inviting us to see we are wounded healers and preserving us from being possessed by one archetype. Yeah, like you become overly possessed by the archetype that I'm the helper in the family. I'm the one where the buck stops. I'm the one who's supposed to make sure everybody else is okay. If you were brought up that way, you were possessed by the one archetype of the helper, and then you're not ever in the other archetype, which is the one who is helped. And remember I said at the beginning, um, it's a wonderful thing to be able to live out all the archetypes, not just one. So, um, these are the times in life when you're in the dark night of the soul, when you're depressed, when you just can't activate your inner resources and you don't even want contact with other people. You're just kind of hiding away. But it's also a feature of the hero's journey story. I'll give examples. There's always the time when the hero is rendered immobile and needs help from someone else, often someone who that he never expected to get help from. Simple example is uh, picture Robin Hood in the film that we've all seen. Um, picture Robin Hood in jail, waiting to be hanged, but made Marion, unbeknownst to him, invisible ally, Maid Marian has come up with a plan that will save him. So even if you have all the powers the way Robin Hood had, the time comes when you're going to need help. And if your family has trained you to be the one who always has to help, it's going to be hard for you to accept help. And that's the equivalent of a disability. So we really want to keep our eye on that. Uh, Alan Olson. Uh, we do not receive wisdom. We must discover it for ourselves after a journey through the wilderness, which no one else can make for us and from which no one could spare us, Marcel Proust. Should I keep reading? Yeah. A dark night of the soul. 
Too often we are like Ulysses who believed he could only be his real self in the active phases of the hero archetype. In this phase, that of warrior, as the idol king of Ithaca, he did not understand that the time had come for him to sit in meditation, write his memoirs, ponder his legacy, attend a philosophy school, write a new poem. Everybody follow? Sometimes we think, oh, I'm supposed to just keep going. And uh, we don't get it that the time has come just to sit meditatively, to concentrate on whatever legacy we have to leave behind, um, to join the poetry class, you know, do quiet things rather than have to be um, out there making sure the world will survive. Okay, Josie. So what is this assisting force, this invisible assisting force? Something we know, not what, is always and everywhere lovingly at work. We know not how to make the world more than it is now, to make us more than we are yet. That something is our ally, a higher power than ego, the impelling force of evolution, the inexhaustible lively energy of the universe, our own true enlightened nature, all are one single reality, a sacred heart of love, our heart at its best. Thank you, Josie. That is my summary of the origin of the invisible assisting force that now we understand is in the entire universe. It's not limited to any person, place, or thing. Or another way of saying it is, even this earth on which we're standing now is our ally. It's giving us stability. It's allowing us to go places. So what is it? It's, it's something we don't know what it is. It's a mystery. But what we do know is it, it seems to be working in our favor. It's trying to help us. When does it try to help us? Always. Where does it try to help us? Everywhere. How does it try to help us? In a loving way. Not punitive. Always caring about us. Well, exactly how is it doing that? We don't know how. It's a mystery. It has something to do with the evolutionary process by which this universe is continuing to roll along and is holding us in an environment that seems to have some caring in it. Caring about what? About our fulfilling our destiny. What is our destiny? It is to co-create a world of justice, peace, and love each in our own little way. That's how we make the world more than it is now and make ourselves more than we are yet. That's something that we, to whose mystery we bow, that something is our ultimate ally. It has many names. Sometimes it's called God. Sometimes it's called higher power than ego. Sometimes it's called the impelling force of evolution. Sometimes it's called the lively energy of the universe. Or it's even our own true enlightened nature. But it's ultimately just one single reality, no matter how many names have been given to it. What is that single reality? It's the sacred heart of love. Mm -hmm. 
which is, of course, our own heart when it beats in concert with that of the universe, God, Christ, Buddha, Krishna, Allah, however you want to describe it. But ultimately, it's all one. Uh, Judith Loveless, are you with us? Hmm? Judith? Yes, I'm here. Okay, you can read the next one. Okay. What have we ever more or better than our life together? From my book, How to Be an Adult in Love. And the next one? That's all, folks. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good.